I was going to post this as a short ramble on my Mastodon account, but ended up having so many new ideas while writing it that it morphed into a video. Whoops. While I'm sure it's not new to most of you that the environment of capitalism forces us to be ambitious as a way of clawing for dear life, side hustles, second jobs, and extreme couponing being a few examples, a societal consequence of this forced ambition is the way people in everyday conversation encourage this way of thinking by assuming ambition by default. For instance, when you're asked about your job, and it's something entry-level like a position in the service industry, or your first steps into a trade or medical field, it seems inevitable that the next question is always, what are you going to do after this? Or some variation that assumes you're not staying there long, like when are you opening your own practice, or when are you testing for a higher position? When one assumes ambition by default, they aim, whether consciously or not, to make someone uncomfortable in their current position, implying that they will eventually be too good for that job, or that it's shameful to stay with something so entry-level. It teaches people, even those who genuinely enjoy such jobs, to feel like they're doing something wrong by not being ambitious. Some people like to stay entry-level because they enjoy the nature of more involved, on-the-ground work. Fresh students tend to be plentiful and will be out in the field, but once you've built up years and years of experience, your time has suddenly become too valuable to be spent on similar tasks. This is what ends up shifting experienced workers towards less involved positions like quality assurance, management, and training. Basically put, the corporate ladder ensures that you never become content or passionate about an entry-level position. I find this unfortunate as someone who considers themselves passionate about passion. It brings me joy to see someone excited about a topic and, through it, be motivated to gain a sense of pride in their passion. We don't tend to foster this key factor of human happiness anymore because the systems that upheld it have all been failing. A school is only motivated to provide you with programs and courses for passions that reflect positively on them. Sporting events, choir concerts, band performances, and if you're in a nice school, mathlete contests and robotics competitions are the majority of what you're provided. If you have interests outside of that restrictive list, you're shit out of luck. Parents are also in no position to foster hobbies. The lack of family leave and rising cost of living has turned time into a premium, and they don't have much of it to spend with their kids. It's only when their kids become adults and move out that they realize the only people who will remember their extra hours at the office were their kids, not their boss. That window of opportunity flies by fast, and plenty of parents are bound to miss it. Even affinity groups are hard to come by in the increasingly antisocial age where we lack third spaces to host them in the first place. All of these systems, where one would eventually pick up a hobby to be passionate about, are dissolving right in front of us. We lack the infrastructure to help everyday people find meaning eventually during their lifespans. This infrastructure isn't without flaw, though, and you're bound to only learn performative or generalized hobbies through its systems. However, when I think of passion, it's not just about empowering the artisan, the craftsperson, or the thinker. We often forget the passion includes the valleys between those peaks, or as I'd like to call them, passions of the mundane. The YouTube channel Posey is a great example of how passions of the mundane can bring just as much meaning as more extravagant ones. He's had a long-standing interest with segmented displays, which has inspired his knack for figuring out how some technologies work. He also used to play around with the analog controls of cheap hi-fi sets as a kid, which fueled his later forays into electronic music. But what does the death of passion infrastructure and passions of the mundane have to do with people assuming ambition by default of entry-level workers? Well, it keeps those who enjoy such positions from ever developing a passion for it, as if they're not allowed to be different from those who believe they're temporarily embarrassed millionaires. As I said earlier, this way of talking down to people who are in entry-level jobs shames them because the grunt work is looked down upon, and even more so if you decided to stick with it. Those who become outwardly prideful of such mundanity have become a common American punchline, painting characters who are content and even joyful at stereotypically entry-level jobs, such as the cliché burger flipper, as being airheaded or unintentionally comedic. This tends to be a theme in shows like Spongebob, Keenan and Kel's Good Burger, and Bob's Burgers. One person's multifaceted passions shouldn't be restricted to hobbies or identities that serve the ego exclusively through social recognition. No, True passion is about feeling free to enjoy extravagant things while simultaneously appreciating that which many others consider boring or simplistic. A passion doesn't have to be performative or highly profitable to be valid. This concept should include work as well. Wouldn't it be nice if those who like the grunt work could stay with it instead of feeling forced to move on due to social pressures or a higher cost of living? It's generally acknowledged that nicer jobs are ones in which it's easier to see yourself in your work because your importance means there's less people above you to tell you no. Why can't we apply that philosophy to people of all occupations instead of forcing them to be more ambitious to earn such a privilege? Maybe this is an odd example. Let's be real, this video is full of them. 
But Robin Williams' character in the movie One Hour Photo, Seymour Parrish, has a charming trait of diligence to him. While he's obviously the bad guy of the film, this trait fleshes out his character in a way that captivates interest. Novice writers tend to overlook this effect because they're too busy reminding the audience that the villain is evil that they forget to write an interesting villain. Anyways, developing film at a general store isn't seen as glamorous work, and considering that you have to be competitive, read cheap, it doesn't provide incentive for one working such a job to be concerned with specifics or a high bar of quality. You're there to clock in, do what's expected of you, clock out, and go home. At least, that's how most are expected to function, but Seymour is an outlier. He's an example of someone who embodies passion of the mundane. He's the one taking extra time to calibrate color tones on the machines within tight tolerances most people won't notice, arguing with his boss that this isn't a detail he can simply overlook. On the surface level, this seems meaningless. Frivolous, even. Seymour might feel accomplished when he's doing work that meets his high standards, but what does it matter if the average customer requesting his work doesn't care? The kinds of people who are developing their photos while they shop at a general store don't care about the absolute color accuracy of the product. If they did, they'd be going through the headache of shipping it off to a specialist and getting test prints to scrutinize it to their tastes. In this explanation lies the problem. The choice element of capitalism. The entry-level workers who are more exposed and accessible to the public are more likely to sell the cheap stuff because the product of their work is mundane, average, and nothing a person is going to fawn over. Point being, it isn't emotionally rewarding. Meanwhile, the other option, that of quality, is hidden away from everyday people. The workers passionate about their craft don't have the corporate funding for brick-and-mortar stores, advertising, or opening up a shop in a high-traffic location. You have to already be an enthusiast or the kind of person who cares to access them. What this does is it trains everyday people not to expect more than the bare minimum, and it alienates workers who care about their craft because they cannot afford to be close enough to their customers to see the fruits of their labor. Passion is a poison in this market, so it's kept away from you and treated as a special luxury only for the rich or those who care enough to be deserving. Constant alienation keeps consumers from expecting better and workers from learning their jobs can be meaningful and dignifying. I'm sure this puzzles some economists, though. If I'm pointing out that a lack of passion in capitalism not only scams everyone, but is also inefficient because you have to bully the worker to do jobs they don't care about and the consumer to buy shit they don't want, th then why are we still doing this? And I could say that it's because these practices simply benefit the capitalists, but that's a cop-out I could tell you in my sleep. It's not just about the money, but the culture. When capitalism forgoes utmost profits for something, that something is usually a reinforcement of the capitalist ideology. As David Kane implies in his essay, Your Lifestyle Has Already Been Designed, working less would make people more productive, and thus more efficient, but we aren't doing this because overworked people are more purchase-happy as a way to compensate for their scarce free time. As with capitalism being passion-averse, the effect is similar. Sure, passionate workers would be more efficient due to being less alienated from their labor, but the system still doesn't encourage this because it turns a person's job into a craft. And this distinction is very important. When college students are surveyed in regards to their likeness of socialism, it's humanities and liberal arts majors such as philosophy, anthropology, English, sociology, and music who see socialism more favorably. Contrast that with majors that usually serve the interests of the state or capitalism, such as criminology, economics, finance, and accounting, and you will predictably find people who are much less in favor of socialism. If people started looking at their jobs less as an annoyance they do for survival and more like an art that is a core part of their identity, they start to adopt the same mindset as those socialist-loving artists and philosophers have. So, while individuals would have better labor output in conditions that benefit both parties in a market, we don't encourage this more efficient way of working because it would kill trust in the system. Stepping back to look at this, it's ironic that fair and functioning market systems are discouraged in practice under capitalism. These are not bugs, but rather features of the system that it fervently defends by trying to imply it's utopian to expect our jobs to be a meaningful part of our lives and identities that respect our limited time on Earth. If it wasn't ironic enough that a system which claims to favor efficiency above all else abandons those ideals in practice, it's even more so that it tries to label removing this system of choice as wasteful. I certainly got the impression when I was younger that offering quality as the default is wasteful because some people don't require a high standard of it out of their photo prints or tools or other day-to-day -day objects, and thus it's wasteful to give them more than they need at that present moment. But let's think this through for a minute. Wouldn't we save money by not segregating the good services from the subpar ones? Wouldn't it be nice if people didn't have to waste their time figuring out where to get the quality option? Yeah, let's say you don't need a serious set of tools for the small project you're working on or for a long period of time, but wouldn't it still be less wasteful to rent a quality set or receive one and let those tools live a second, third, and fourth life in the hands of consecutive owners? 
Maybe you don't care about the quality of your photo prints now, but wouldn't it be nice to not regret having done them cheaply because one of those pictures ended up having sentimental value in hindsight? Wouldn't it be nice if I wasn't typing this on a budget keyboard whose worn out keycaps can't be replaced because the company didn't have the foresight to sell replacements, forcing me to buy a proper fucking keyboard because I didn't do it the first time? By playing these games of choice, we only enable a system that convinces us it's necessary to produce meaningless things on the output of apathetic workers because the masses are undeserving of better and the workers who make all of this undeserving of a meaningful job. It doesn't take more to make meaningful, long-lasting products by default. It's less materials over time because people don't have to replace them as often, less mental hardship on the side of the worker because they only need to produce a low volume of goods instead of a high volume of bads, yes, that's a real economic term, look it up, and less time wasted playing this game where we have to suddenly become market researchers just to avoid being shafted. By shining keycaps. I'm hammering this point so hard because I know some economists who are purely numbers-minded couldn't give a damn less if the workers fueling the economy are happy, let alone passionate, about their jobs as long as the GDP is good. That's why I'm arguing this is also an issue of efficiency, not exclusively mental well-being. I don't think it will ever be within the interests of those who are at the helm of this system to fix these issues. Workers will have more self-respect for themselves and a greater disdain for capitalism if we allow them to feel secure in entry-level jobs and passionate no matter how perceivably important their work is. Furthermore, not every job can be made into a passion, and this would quickly reveal how meaningless a lot of work in the current system is. Basically, we would become too conscious of how exploited we are and how meaningless our day-to-day -day drudgery is that it'd be hard to keep revolutionary action at bay. The best person to uphold such oppressive systems is someone who's ambitious enough to step on people's toes to keep chasing more, but constantly unfulfilled because they have replaced their internal motivations with external ones in an effort to alienate themselves from the passion and meaning they so desperately crave from society. Be passionate not just for yourself, but as a way of being protected from those that wish to sell off your self-worth to the lowest bidder.